Hi everyone. Oh, yeah. uh, welcome again. Or this is the this is the fifth uh, meetup of the Krakow startup community. Uh, it's really great to see you all here. Um, maybe before we begin, I'd like to uh, thank a couple of people that made this uh, meeting possible. First of all, I would like to thank Isa from Applicake. I don't know if she's here, but uh, she was really, really tremendously helpful uh, in uh, setting this all up. Um, I would also like to thank our sponsors. Uh, the the fact that we're here in this great place is uh, is thanks to uh, Fundacja Nowe Technologie from Tarnów. And I would also like to uh, thank Brightberries for sponsoring today's prizes uh, of the pitch competition. Yeah, so, Rafa. yeah. Yeah, Rafa is somewhere here. He's just getting a beer. Yeah, so... He'll be here, but you, you, you can still give them a warm welcome. So, <laughs> yeah. so I, I think like, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago, uh, we announced that we were looking for volunteers, and uh, we were actually very uh, surprised and blown away by the fact that so many people uh, offered their help to us, uh, and uh, we'll soon begin, begin working with them. Uh, but even right now, I would like to uh, thank all of the ones that uh, offered their help to us. Uh, so yeah, please give them a warm uh, yeah. applause. Yeah. You probably know that already. Um, uh, we're really happy to have uh, and host Amanda Rose in Krakow. She's a serial entrepreneur, um, social entrepreneur um, on top of that. Um, the founder of uh, Connect the Dots Foundation, Founder of Twestival, which some of you might have participated in last March. And she's been working with um, many big brands. She knows everyone. And when I'm, I'm, I'm not going to say any names, but she knows everyone. You can just assume I'm, I'm yeah. I'm like, uh, what I learned during the last two days is like, okay, like, what, what, what are we even talking about? So, um, um, yeah, and she's. Uh, I, I'm, yeah, I'm pretty sure we'll have some interesting <laughs> um, conversations. And uh, yeah, so let's let's move on to the interview. And so, uh, and if you have any questions or if something you know pops up in your head, just make sure you note it down somewhere, and then we can we'll we'll start with the interview, and then we we'll move to the Q and A if if you have any more questions. So, um, so can I just say this yeah. is one of my favorite cities in Europe? So I'm I'm really happy to be here, and it's and there the is a re there is a reason for that. <laughs> Why is your favorite city in Europe? <laughs> no, anyway, okay. okay, so uh, you started your first company when you were 16, right? Okay, do you wanna do you wanna tell us about it? Well, I don't know company. I I think I don't know how many of you feel as if you're an entrepreneur, but when I was 16, I was really into design and graphic design and. Um, while I was in school, I just started picking up odd jobs, and next thing I knew, uh, well, I'm Canadian, but next thing I knew, I started um, having a, my own business. And I started doing things like brochures for the YMCA and um, designing logos for local businesses and things like that. So it wasn't necessarily a full-time um, company, uh, but it, you know, I, I set it up and I started to get my own roots. And I also was involved in a lot of programs like Junior Achievement, which I don't know how many of you are familiar with Junior Achievement, but it's sort of a... I think it's worldwide, but more in North America, where you start to learn about um, having your own business and things like that. So you pick a product, and um, so I was heavily involved in that in, in school. So, so d have you ever worked at any other company, like, or was it always like have I worked for the man? For yeah, <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> no, but have yeah, have you actually ever been employed? By yeah, any, absolutely, yeah. and I, I actually don't mind. Um, I have to work in an environment where I feel like I've got some some control, some autonomy, I can be creative, but I definitely, um, my first job in that way, I mean, I also have to say, I think it's really important early on in your career, I probably wouldn't hire anybody myself unless they worked a service job, because um, I think it's really important. I worked at, um, I don't know if you know Tim Hortons, how many of you have been to Canada? Yeah, Tim Hortons. <laughs> so when I was in high school, you know, I also worked at Tim Hortons, and I lived in Atlanta, and I worked at Arby's, you know, roast beef sandwiches. And, you know, not for a great length of time. It's not a huge portion on my CV, but I think it's important in it. You know, every time I washed the floor, I was thinking, I'm not going to do this again. I'm not going to do this again. Um, but, yeah. yeah. I work as a waitress for several summers. Yeah. In a row. Yeah. yeah, I think it's really important. But my first real job, I was working in a boutique ad agency. 
uh, where I was really lucky. I had the opportunity to, to run big events and work on huge projects for different brands in Toronto. Um, and I was working part of a really creative team, and I, I, I loved it. But it came to a point where I, I knew I needed to start my take my ideas and turn them into something else. So, so what came next? What what was the what was your kind of first second uh, company? Um, I'm not really like a traditional person. <laughs> even even the roles I have that I was referencing when I was working for the ad agency. Um, I was a receptionist for the first two weeks, and then I became an office manager, which basically means I did lots of stuff. Um, and I'm not someone that needs a, t a title, so um, I don't know. I'm trying to think what the next... I, I'm a really project-based person, so when you say company, um, I worked on different projects. Um, but probably my biggest company before I got more into technology in the digital space. Um, I lived in London and I founded a film and event locations company called Space Two. Um, and I actually had a real job working for the man for <laughs> Land Securities, which is the largest property company in the UK. Um, but basically commercialization. So the idea of taking a new space, a reception, a rooftop, a doorway, I can make money out of that. Um, so my clients were like the BBC, and I worked on uh, films like The Born Identity and uh, 28 Weeks Later, and you know, it's amazing what you can actually make money out of and what people will pay for. So if you need a space in London, the company still runs, but I took my equity out because I got bored after a while. So, um. <laughs> <laughs> And so um, you discovered Twitter really early on, and that kind of led to what you... Um, I mean, how, this is kind of how we met. Mm -hmm. not, not, I mean, we met, we met at a talk, tech conference two years ago, and then since then, you know, yeah. we were just, like, tweeting and then exchanging messages yeah. sometimes. But we really m met uh, because of Twestival, an initiative you started... Um, I'm not even sure when you started, in 2000. 2008, was it? Yeah, I mean, Twestival, I guess to give a little background of how mm -hmm. I got into Twitter, um, when I took my equity of the company I just talked about, the film and event locations company, um, I didn't want to go and rush into something new, and I didn't really want to start freelancing. So I thought, what am I going to do? I'm going to go back to school. <laughs> so I decided to go back and do my master's. And I had a business degree already, so I thought, what's the point of an... I don't know how you feel. We can talk about this later. But an MBA, I'm not really sure of the value of an MBA unless you need more connections and things like that. I already had a firm rooting in business. Um, but I really wanted an opportunity to learn for a year something that interested me, which was communications. Um, and also because I have a strong events background, um, I ended up going to London Met University and I did a one-year degree in communications management, which is a sexy way of saying PR. Um, and I knew that I wanted to study this burgeoning uh, social networking. You know, this is 2007, so Facebook's starting to become stronger, but still not quite mainstream. But it's when you start to go like, oh, all my high school friends are following me. This is, you know, this is all coming together. And then I realized that actually for my dissertation, um, I was at a conference in Brussels. It was a PR-related conference, which most PRs tend to be early adopters. They started to use uh, Twitter. And I was familiar with Twitter, but how it changed the event, where there could be a back channel. You know, some of you could be tweeting and saying how bad I am right now. <laughs> and it evolves There's the conversation. There's no coverage here, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> I'll find you later. Um, you know, there could be this uh, back channel of communication, and for me, that was really fascinating. So I dumped Facebook, even though that would have been great to study as well, and I really started to look closer at Twitter. So Twitter being five years old now, you can imagine I was, um, I was actually the second person in the world to research it from an academic standpoint. So I spent um, most of that year researching Twitter. And you almost joined the early yeah. Twitter team, right? <laughs> I would have been like under 20 employees. I almost went to go work for Twitter. But um, I was in London and I didn't really want to leave. And yeah, so and then, do I regret that? So, no. so, so, when, so, when, so when did the idea of like Twestival materialize and how like w we talked yeah. about it today, like how you need an idea and then the idea is the... 10% and there's the execution and the energy needed just to keep it going. But yeah. So w w when was it? Was it 
So twist of all, it used to, um, so after I finished my master's, that was about like the fall of um, 2008. Yeah, gosh, a while ago now. Um, and because of all these people I met through Twitter, this was, you know, now it's pretty common to go to events and sometimes have a name tag with your Twitter handle and, um, you know, see people offline. But at the time, a few years ago, it was very unusual. Um, so a lot of people were connecting on Twitter but hadn't met in real life. And when I finished, I had a bit of time because I was a student and all of a sudden I wasn't. And so we decided in a matter of uh, two weeks in London to put an event together. My friends had one too many drinks and uh, came up with the name Twestival, uh, or Twitter Festival. Um, but it was actually called Harvest Twestival. So the idea of bringing canned goods. So if you would come here, we would ask you to you know, bring canned goods at the door, make a donation. Um, we ended up having 250 people uh, that came. It was sold out. You know, We built it into this great momentum that everybody wanted to go. Um, we're in TechCrunch, and uh, my friend Mike Butcher did a really nice piece comparing us to a venture capital event, and we won. Ours was more fun. Um, so, yeah, so after that, everyone kind of wanted to be a part of it. Um, but for me, the way Twestival is now turned into is also through my research and just through my natural travels and network. I had a good international um, network of people that I liked. So after the first one happened, I started to think, wow, okay, this is an event, but what if we could get all these different cities to host events on the same day, you know, for the same cause? That'd be really powerful. You know, micro don donations, we talk about micro donations and how $5 or 5 euros can add up to something really powerful. So, um, yeah, so that was the seed of the idea, and then I... And then it grew from zero to, <coughs> in total, like millions money raised, right, in, in donations over the yeah. course of three, three years, right? So what's the future of festival? So, um, so we've now had four campaigns in the last two and a half years. It's 100% volunteer run. Uh, we've raised $1.75 million uh, for 285 nonprofit organizations and causes around the world, um, which is great. So we're at a point of reflection where, you know, there's only so much momentum you can build around a cause because Twitter isn't young anymore. People are going to a lot of events. Um, but there's still a lot of people that want to be hosting you know, that host events naturally, and they would love to be able to use a brand like Twestable, which is trusted and respected, and people know that they're doing a good thing by coming out. So um, I'm in the midst of transitioning because I have new projects to be working on. Um, and so um, looking at uh, moving to more of like a TEDx model where people could apply to use it in their local community. But. So for those who, I mean, probably most of us don't really know what that term is, uh, I have to say. <laughs> like in the, so what, what is actually social entrepreneurship? Because, I mean, both of the, na both of the uh, like pieces of the n noun, I guess, make sense. But like what, 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 what actually, what, it, what, what does it actually mean? I think we all have like a vague idea of what that might mean. But yeah, I don't know either. <laughs> no, no, I'm, 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 I'm laughing, I'm laughing. Um, no, I think it's, it's sort of like an entrepreneur. I mean, a lot of people think by all of a sudden creating a website and putting CEO founder, you're an entrepreneur. You know, in the same way, it's, this, it's similar for being a social entrepreneur. I mean, does it mean you start a nonprofit and then you're a social entrepreneur? You know, you made a donation to Charity Water and all of a sudden you're a social entrepreneur because you have a creative spin on it? I don't know. I don't. Um, I don't want to close anybody off in terms of being a social entrepreneur. But my vision of what a social entrepreneur is is, you know, you're innovating. You're taking a concept, but the social part of it is that you're looking for a way to give back. It's positively feeding back into your community or into the world, and it's making change. You know, we say changing the world. <laughs> so can it can but, it be for profit as well? Or yeah, yeah absolutely. It, yeah. Actually, I think most of the smart ways of doing things are um, have a have a balance of that model. Um, I don't know if you've heard of Tom's Shoes, but you know uh, Blake Mycosi, who founded uh, Tom's, is brilliant. I mean, in the fact that you buy shoes and um, you're getting a great product, but you know by buying those shoes, you're actually giving a pair of shoes to someone in the developing world who maybe barefoot, <laughs> and so it's useful. Um, and you know, and it's profitable. The shoes aren't cheap. They're not, you know, 9.99 or something. They actually, 
you know, you have to think about it, but people don't mind paying that because it's a great product and they know what it means. And there's people that are taking a similar model with a company called uh, Warby Parker, uh, and they're doing that with eyeglasses. So the same idea of you buy a pair of eyeglasses, which actually are quite affordable, but it's going to give it to people in the developing world. So, so do you essentially think that every company should consider incorporating social good into their PR and marketing strategies? I mean, not, not just, like, let's say more into their business model, but also communicating it in, like, in, in their PR and marketing strategies? I think, um, I think not to the detriment of a business. I mean, you have to focus on your bottom line because ultimately what's actually better is for you to have a very profitable company and take those dividends or whatever it is and reinvest. Um, there's a lot of companies like eBay, which is a huge, you know, huge international company. And what they tend to do, and I know this because I work with them, <laughs> but they tend to use their users and they will do things like a checkout. So if you buy something on eBay, you can add a dollar or however it works wherever you are in the world. And on average, that'll raise X amount for a certain organization that week. But they didn't do anything. They were using their platform as a, as a motivation for good. So I think there's different ways to go about it. And I always gravitate, I mean, as particularly women as well, who tend to be a lot of the people who are buying the sort of consumer um, products online, um, always look towards companies. I, I don't have some exact stats, but if you do any kind of research, it always pops up. People will gravitate towards those companies that are making um, positive impact in the world, um, whether they're doing that through giving their users, um, you know, or customers a choice to do something positive or actually taking a stand um, and promoting that. So, but definitely not at the detriment of your business because the more successful your business is, um, the more good you're able to do and choose to do that yeah. good. So, Which I think is just really important for, for everyone to understand that the idea of social entrepreneurship is not, okay, you're just, especially like uh, social startup entrepreneurship where you're creating some kind of online campaign, but it's non-profit and it's, Uh, kind of vaguely defined what the results are going to be. It's actually, it can be like a hardcore business and with great business model, very innovative, but a part of it is just like making sure yeah. there are some positive externalities in, 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 in the form of like, you know, doing some social good, which is... Yeah, absolutely. I'm actually a terrible example of a social entrepreneur, like, because I, <laughs> with Twestable, I, uh, I made zero money. I lived on sofas and things like that. But I was, you know, I was in a pattern where ethically with... You know, I'm working with two to three thousand volunteers in different countries around the world. I, you know, for the model. But now I'm at a stage where I have to kind of think for the longevity and the impact of what I want to do with Twestable. Um, we can do more, but I need to hire somebody. I, I'm bored, so I don't want to do it myself anymore. But, <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I think you need to be you need to be smart and not. I don't know, like, you, you are much better for your business and for the causes you want to support if you take care of yourself as well. So being for profit can, can be great. So I think you have a very good experience in working both with uh, volunteers and uh, like on like totally not, not for profit causes, but you've also worked with bigger brands. And so from a startup perspective, for, for, for those of us who want to build um, startups, focus on enterprise like f f products, um, how, what, what is like, what are there any tips or any, any you know, thoughts you have on working with bigger brands? brands. You work with BBC, you work with L, you work with you know, eBay, YouTube. You, like, you, you did work with some like, big companies, right? Yeah, I mean, I was working from a contractor perspective. So I was, you know, we offered services that they needed. But um, I don't know, I think a lot of the businesses that I've created, like if I look back at the film and event locations where I did work with BBC and other other clients, you know, we had a model that was very protective and offered a percentage um, where we could filter back and, and have sort of a, a commitment going. But do you mean about marketing or in, in terms of... Just in terms of like how... I think it's just a whole... And um, it's a... It's a it's pretty much the experience that no, like most people here are young and haven't worked with bigger mm -hmm. international brands. Like how, if there are any tips. But, you know, if, if there aren't, then that's... <laughs> I'm <laughs> that's, sure there are, I don't know specifically um, it depends on the situation I mean if you, if you could give me an example of a business I what I'm really good at y yes I'm an entrepreneur but probably um, 
and we'll, we'll talk about what I'm about to work on probably a little bit later, but what I'm really good at is creatively coming up with concepts and strategies and ideas around how to make something grow or scale or be interesting or get people excited about it. So if somebody has an example that you want to um, throw at me, I'm happy to give you my opinion. So. <laughs> so let's talk about PR because many startups are not really good at PR. And I asked you, asked you before, some people are, like, there are some opinions that you, you know, you don't really have to focus that much on PR from the beginning. You should focus on product, nailing the product, 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 product. And, you know, on the other side of the scale, you have PR, uh, you know, communicate everything as early as possible. So, um, we talked about it before and you said that, you think PR is actually important and you should not, like, you know, even if you have to hire a PR firm, it's it's arrogant of startups to think they won't need PR because everyone has to communicate with the rest of the world. Like, there are similar products probably being built. So what are your PR, like, tips for startups? Do you have any... Yeah, I mean, just to sort of clarify my views on this, I obviously have okay. a communications and PR background, yeah. so yeah. I'm a little bit um, opinionated on that. But I think... What is detrimental, that's kind of started to be a trend. You'll see it on TechCrunch and people will write posts, um, Mashable or anywhere, it doesn't matter, about, oh, we are a startup and we got this press and we don't need anybody. And uh, there's just a sense of arrogance that you can do it all alone. And what people don't understand is that, okay, you can also have crappy PR people, so <laughs> I'm not going to vouch. And you can also have businesses that, yes, if you have an amazing product, you're very lucky because you won't need PR. But these P PR people have a constant relationship with journalists, with people that are writing stories, thinking about stories. So yes, well, you may be able to get a piece about how you got half a million in funding or five million in funding if you're very lucky or whatever. People love those. And lots of congratulations. And you may see a spike. Longevity, like actually keeping normal users like my mom and dad and those people that potentially you would want, Investing in strong communications is, is yeah. really important. And, you know, there may be a journalist, maybe someone from the New York Times, who's working on a piece about small businesses and things that may help them with their taxes or administration. And for them to have, you know, a voice saying, oh, have you thought of this startup? Have you, they're actually doing something really valuable and unique, where it's not a piece just about your startup, but you're listed along with one or two others. And that's the kind of thing that will have a link to your site and people will experience it. And PR, the value of PR next to um, advertising, it's like when we used to do reports, it's like 10 times the value of actually buying an ad because people are saying it. So what was your question? So, it tips, yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so tip. I feel like even last time we, we were hosting Mike Butcher and probably some of you did see Mike's talk and I even had a feeling like because of what Mike's is doing and obviously he's an editor uh, yeah. of TechCrunch and he was focusing more on online PR and like as that as if that was the full range of like the spectrum and you know there's a lot of value in offline offline PR right and like making sure you're you're yeah in whatever press is there absolutely and I mean I so I was advising a startup in Toronto um, about a year and a half ago about you know, get, their idea was gifting. So you can have gift cards and um, an easy way to partner with different um, shopping centers and things like that, an easy way to give a gift. And a, par a big part of our strategy was not digital because the people that are starting to invest in this are going through the subway, you know, they're getting on buses, you start to have their attention. And that's, you know, that's more like advertising. But then you get into people that are actually on the street and sort of, you know, that gorilla... PR marketing, you know, there's a real crossover with marketing and PR now. People don't quite understand um, the difference, but I would look at all those kind of quirky opportunities. I mean, you s a lot of people go gangbusters at South by Southwest or those big conferences where they set up booths and they do all that dress up or do something crazy. And I think there's something in with that. You know, you have to set yourself apart from your competition or for what's happening. Um, other tips, what I would say is, especially if you don't, if you don't have the funds, because I'm not saying go and hire an agency, um, if you don't have the funds to do that, what I would say are, my tips would be, really find out where your customers are in terms of what they're reading. So, you know, are, are they going to be reading TechCrunch? Is that really where you should be focused? Because I love TechCrunch, but 
you know, we're kind of in incestual of we like to read about each other's stuff where, you know, if you're building a product, maybe a women's magazine is probably better for what you're doing. So I would look at the staff, who the writers are, start to follow them on Twitter, get to know who they are, um, re, you know, see what they're, read, what they're writing about, and just start to understand. And, you know, there's no harm if you, if you can't afford a PR person. What you're buying with PR people is you're buying their relationships. You're buying their trust and relationships that they've built over time. But there's no reason you can't do that. You can send something that's a little more personal. You know, maybe they tweeted, I don't know, I can give you an example. Like, it, maybe they tweeted something about they lost their, I don't know, their hat or something. You know, but you saw that as a tweet. And that's someone that you actually want to have a conversation with, potentially, who could write or be really interesting for your business. You know, maybe you send them a hat in the post and say, we heard you lost your hat. And that's an introduction. That's a gateway to get to somebody who's kind of like, ah, oh, they went out of their way. It's not a press release. It's not a, you know, introduction. And, you know, they're just real people. So, and Twitter and social media gives us a gateway to those kind of unique personal ways to do it. And now, I, don't be a stalker either. And I, <laughs> like, I just can say that, right, I feel like a journalist, kind of, because I went to the web with PressPass yeah. from TechCrunch, and my email address was on the press list, so I got all the bunch of, like, unsolicited email, like, ah, we're releasing this, and I have, like, my email, my mailbox, is f my, in my inbox is full with those emails, like, it's terrible. Like, I would never want to be a journalist. Seriously. It's just, like, people throwing stuff at you and, like, do this, do this. I'm, like, okay, delete, delete, delete. Like, even if I wasn't, like, was actually doing that, I would probably not do anything with it because it's, like, out of context. Like, I don't know anything about them. And they're just, like, write about us. Like, mm. <laughs> so. I think, you know, what they're looking for is they're always looking for story ideas if we're talking about journalists or bloggers. So if you have an interesting story, you know, the story is not about how much funding you got. The story is, you know, how maybe there's a trend happening or something got picked up in the news and you have a way to kind of solve that or something quirky. You know, that's that is what a really good PR person will do for you, is kind of think, ah, oh, that's an angle, that's a story. You know, it's not about a launch, it's not about just Christmas. It's something that you could do all year round to keep you in, in attention, so. So, if you're going to do your PR yourself and you're going to share, uh, you know, spread the world about what you're building yourself, then um, I think networking is very important as a, you know, you have to, have a network first to, to, to then be able to spread the message. So um, you're a huge networker. You, as you, you know, you have a very impressive network of contacts and we also um, talked about it today, like how, um, how, how did you manage to build it essentially and how, and how you know, it, it obviously takes time. It's like nothing is built. Like it, it took you like several years, right? But like, were you like strategic about it? Like, okay, I need to, this is what I need to do, or like this, is, like, this is my approach towards networking, or did it just happen because you have that talent to be able to meet people yeah. easily? I mean, well, if you ask my mom, I was always a networker, because I'd be like at my grandma and my aunt and my uncle, <laughs> like Christmas. But um, no, I think I'm just really interested in people. So I'm interested in what people are doing and... Um, and also how I can help them, because I think a lot of people, when they, see th when they think networking, particularly if they have an American idea of networking, which is horrible, um, you have a stack of 50 business cards in your pocket, and you run around a venue, and if you don't give out all of them, you've failed. And to me, if you th this is how I compare it. If I'm hosting a dinner party, which is also a great way to network, because you start to invite people and maybe ask them to in invite two people, I wouldn't want to be at a dinner with more than a table of six. So that means five other people, four or five other people. And the reason for that, if you think that you have a dinner, you will never get a chance to really have any kind of conversation that's memorable with more people because the table's too long. You can't stretch. You can't. So I think about the same thing with, you know, tonight. I'm going to meet lots of people, I'm sure. I'm looking forward to talking to you. But what I'm looking forward to is those, you know, three, four, five conversations where... I look at the business card tomorrow and I remember you because you told me a great story or you told me something interesting. You weren't necessarily pitching me. You weren't doing that. And that, for me, has been kind of key where I just really like people. You can make me laugh or I'll make you laugh or something. And you just you start a relationship. And my, my sort of networking or whatever has all been based around 
people that I like, people that I want to be around, that I want to spend time with, and that I don't, I don't go with an agenda. I may have one, but it doesn't come across that way because it may take two, three, four times for you to realize the point, but when they don't feel like you have a direct agenda, um, they will come to you and start to... So also why I called my foundation Connect the Dots, because I love, you know, you tell me something, and I'm like, you should really talk to this person. And that's a really great way to actually get to know someone, is when someone says, um, you know, I'm doing this, and I really would love to do this, and then something springs and goes, ah, I actually talked to somebody, you should really do that. That sort of pay-it-forward mentality. Um, which actually my friend Daniel from Spotify was speaking at LeWeb and I watched his talk and I was just like, it's good we're friends because, <laughs> because I can totally see how his thinking is very similar to mine and how he values relationships in that pay it forward. You know, um, he was talking about how entrepreneurs, any, he gets an opportunity to talk to entrepreneurs. He will always give one sentence or two sentences back. Even if he doesn't have time, he'll make a point of um, doing that because he knows... Um, the value of, yeah. of feedback and all of that, so if that helps. Um, okay, so um, tell us more about the new... So I know about the, you know, you're, you're running three things simultaneously, pretty much, and but maybe we can... Maybe you could tell us about what you're doing right now. There's a campaign you're working on, right? That coming up in several in a few months. Yeah, so I'm um, I'm in the midst of a couple projects. I always have these sort of social good projects where I call it my ten percenter project, but it ends up always turning into more. So um, there's some uh, charitable concepts that I'm putting together online, which you'll hear more about if you follow me on Twitter because we'll announce that in January. But there's two big things I'm working on, which are um, I'm working on a startup, so that's also why I'm here to meet this crew, see what they can help me build, because I wish I could code. Oh my goodness, I wish I could. <laughs> like you know, and my friends are like, you can. I'm like, nah, I need six months or something to put aside. So like my ideas can't wait. But um, I've been really, as you can probably tell, I've been really passionate about working with volunteers, and my. My like passion is about how we can use technology to bring people offline and connect in the real world and have more connections and do that. So um, there's, uh, there's a problem that I've been dealing with, which is how can we take the friction out of people who, who want to give their time and talent, which we kind of know as volunteering. Um, but I'm not sure that's even a great word anymore because there's so many connotations around that. But essentially, people that would give up a Saturday afternoon if they knew that there was a great project to paint a school or be involved. Um, so taking the friction out of people that want to give their time and talent and opportunities for them to do that. Um, and right now, there's too many sites that have those drop-down boxes and you know you either get four options or 40,000 options and you have to give a blood sample and wait 12 weeks and do all of that. So I'm looking at how I could build a site that would be in one, two clicks you can volunteer and be involved. Um, and we're starting to work with nonprofit organizations who are thinking about volunteer activities as events. Um, this is what comes back to my events. So um, the site's going to be called Spare Time. Uh, it'll, it'll live at sparetime.org. So very light you know, ways that you could be involved. Um, I do have a global vision for it, but I'm going to be obviously starting in some English markets, being the ones I've lived in most, Canada, UK, and uh, the US. So. Um, and then I'm also, because I know I need some runway time to build that and do that, um, I'm also going to be working on a campaign for Jamie Oliver, who's a uh, well-known celebrity chef, people like. <laughs> um, I lived in the UK for seven and a half years. Um, I have a good relationship. And they actually approached me because of Twestival and said, we want you to run a Twestival. And I said, no. <laughs> it doesn't work like that. We're very independent. Um, but there's a, you know, there's a consciousness about food, which I feel like um, I can add a lot of value to. So we're looking at creating momentum around one day, which will happen at the end of May, where we're going to have people host dinners. And I'm creating components where farmers markets and other, um, other events could take place. So if there's local chefs that want to give cooking lessons and help people start to learn, um, my job is to unite that and create it as a global campaign. It will be a fundraiser, but I'm a big advocate of um, not excluding anyone. So anybody that wants to learn and be involved, we want to find a way 
um, to have a portal, which will be our, our main website and mobile, uh, for you to find out ways to do that in your local community. So anybody that wants to be involved in that, tweet me and, and let me know. We're just, I only got the green light 10 days ago, so, um, so that's what I'm working on. But then I'm focused on my startup from June, so this is my last kind of campaign for a while. So. Um, okay, so maybe do any of you, ha like, do you have any questions? Because... Um, no, how are you doing with the time? No, we still have some time. So, um, I have more questions. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so, um, so how important is getting getting back to the idea of of networking? So, how important do you think timing is in terms of? Um, you know, like how, when you start approaching people. Uh, when do you start like spreading the word, the word, uh, word? Sorry about what you're doing. Like how? It, I'm, I'm not. I'm not sure if that question actually makes sense with like without like knowing yeah, our. Yeah. So our pr like, if you discussion. have an example, yeah, like yeah. if you have a startup yeah. or something. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. I think like because most most of our audience are um, interested in technology, working in technology companies, running their own businesses thinking of running their own businesses and I feel even I'm asking because even I'm being approached like wearing a the web wearing the, the, the press badge uh, I was just like trying not to like make it visible so that because people would just come to me and like throw their pitches at me I'm like hey I, I don't even know who you are I won't listen like if I can imagine that you know first you have to get to know somebody build their trust and then maybe you know like it's there is, it's it's a it's a it's it's a type of relationship where you have. To, it doesn't sound good when you say it like, but you have to be strategic about it. Like you have to plan. Okay, this is the first step. You get to know somebody. If if they're interested in you as a person, then probably they will listen about your idea. But you know, if and then if you if you want to ask for advice or if you want to ask for an introduction, you probably shouldn't ask for an introduction before you feel that the person is confident that your idea is good and you're the right person to in, like to, to introduce yeah. to their network because and I think I think there's something else that we can touch on which is a lot of people are afraid to share their ideas um, that you know oh you have to sign an NDA or you know I can't tell you anything and it's a big secret and and I'm a, you know, unless you're kind of Sean Parker and have some sort of amazing idea or, you know, Mark Zuckerberg or something now, but most investors or people will absolutely turn you away and think that you're crazy, you know, come on. Because we were, we were talking about this, but the idea is only a very small part. You know, there's a lot of people, you've got, you know, people that are reinventing the browser. And it's like, well, we've already got this and, you know, search has already been done. Google's doing it. But as soon as somebody comes out with something better, I mean, look at MySpace. Everyone's like, game over, MySpace, and where are they now? You know, <laughs> it's like people will start to iterate and change, and it's all about the execution. So I'm a big fan of, you know, maybe not uh, sharing absolutely everything, but I get the most value out of my ideas when I share them. And I can't be afraid that somebody else is going to take that idea because how hard is it to start a business or take an idea to fruition. Um, you can't be afraid of that. And the amount of feedback and other th other ideas and value you're going to get out of sitting down with somebody for half an hour and sharing your idea is, is worth a lot more. So don't be afraid to share your ideas um, and sort of, yeah, I mean, people will go, oh, have you ever thought of that? And, and also it makes you stronger too. Like I'm, I was on a call with some potential investors yesterday for my startup and it's good that I understood my market because they were like, oh, have you heard of this startup? And have you heard of this company? Have you heard of them? And I'm like, yeah, actually, I'm friends with the founder. I really like what they're doing. And oh, yeah, I heard, but I don't think that's really working. And, you know, it was really knowledgeable. So it was like a tennis match back and forth. They were testing me, testing me, testing me. And I'm not saying it's even investors that you're talking to, but everybody that you share takes a little piece and um, will start to add value, but it also toughens you, makes you stronger. It makes you more secure in your idea that you can move forward. Um, However, I have a <laughs> big piece of feedback. No, no, I'm serious. Okay. So quite often, people that you'll talk to, um, they will try, they will, 
inevitably point you in the directions that they feel comfortable in and they will give you feedback because it's so easy to tell like okay maybe you should do this and you're like okay we should do this i'm you know i'm we're going through that like right now we're working on a new concept and it's just having spent the last several weeks just talking to people and like you know taking ev like all the feedback i can is it's it's so easy to get lost in the feedback you're getting because everybody will tell you something and everybody will tell you something, you know, you should do this and that this will be something they know, they feel comfortable in and they, you know, that's how they, like, you know, that's how their brain process, like, th that, that's how but, they But think, let yeah. me ask you, so after all of that, and I totally agree, there comes yeah. a point where you have to say enough is enough, yeah. but what, and I already know the answer to this, so that's why I know I'm going to win this conversation, <laughs> but, <laughs> but it actually makes you think, it makes your head spin, and it makes you kind of take a step back and go, what do I really want to do? Like, what is the point of all of this? Because all these questions and things like that, but I think you have to be very secure in your idea um, and, and what you want to do. And having all these people question... It but yeah, th but that's right. Like, eventually, most people uh, will, I mean, will realize, mm -hmm. but there is this startup called Raven, which is uh, a, the marketplace for activities in, in, um, in, the, in, in, in San Francisco. And they, they wrote a big blog post, like how they actually wasted like over a year. Because everyone who was giving them feedback were experts. They weren't like, you know, you have to be secure about your idea, but then you're like this somebody like uh, starting, like um, you, you're starting something new, me starting something new, I mean, uh, starting something new. And, and you're like, okay, like, okay, I'm, you know, just here. And they're like, they already know their stuff and, the, you know, their, their experience in the industry where like you have to, it's you're never going to be more secure. Like you always think, okay, they probably know a bit more than I do. This is why you're asking them for feedback. This is and you also, you know, people, you know, will read something like TechCrunch, and it, you know, maybe there's a little, oh, maybe we should be a group on for women's yeah. shoes. Yeah. We should be <laughs> like, you know, people start to catch waves of things that are popular and trendy, and actually get off their vision. Yeah which I think is, is dangerous. I mean, nobody, well, I would hope that if you're starting something and putting your everything on the line, that you completely believe in your, in your startup or your idea. And no one really knows it better than you. But I think it's important to listen to these ideas. But it comes a point, the same way with networking, there are, sometimes there's a point where there's enough events. I've actually had sort of a, I don't know what it's called, but I've had like a hands up, I'm not going to Lil Web this year. I'm not going to South by Southwest next year. I'm strategically picking the events that are important to me because there's there comes a point where you don't need to meet another person. Um, what are they going to add to that? I think that's still not the case in our ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Right, it's we've, we're not there here yet, yeah. so it's maybe difficult to relate to that. Yeah. But if you're let's say in San Francisco, there is something going on, some kind of tech meetup every day. So if you just want to participate in them, you're just wasting a lot of time. Like uh, honestly, there's. Somebody important will show up there, but it's another event. Like probably it's it's more valuable to just work on whatever you're working in that in that particular case. Yeah. Um, yeah. I just I just think it's a big challenge because you might think yeah it's your idea. You, you probably you really believe in it, but it should work like that. And maybe it works for the fifth time entrepreneur when you're a serial entrepreneur. But I think it's you're it's. You're very, I think there's a lot of insecurity when you're working on something. It's like, it's going to work. Like, no, it's not going to work. It's not. It's so I, I think it's just, it's. Yeah. And I think a lot of people put um, maybe too much weight on social media that it's going to save you, that you're going to tweet or Ashton Kutcher is going to put out a tweet and you're going to, oh, it's we're going to win. We're going to. He's that's an it. investor in many startups. Like if somebody doesn't know, Ashton actually invests in a lot of. Stuff. Yeah, but that's it's not really the case anymore. Maybe a few years ago, it, you know, and it definitely helps you spike. You'll get a lot of traffic right away, but what you're looking for is that conversion, depending on what type of business you're working on. And I'm not an expert. Like, I won't tend to be an expert because I haven't had a lot of investors. I haven't needed it because I work quite lightly and mostly in social goods. So, <laughs> But I see my friends who are going through cases where their investors start to put pressure on them to change the vision and maybe they have someone else in their portfolio that is working for them so they should consider it and i think yeah it's it's a tough balance you definitely have to have a thick skin to be to be an entrepreneur so that's a nice finishing accent <laughs> so uh, guys any questions yeah, yeah. yeah so 
I'm quite interested in, in the idea that maybe you can make too much effort on marketing communications and PR for business to business. If it's a consumer business, I can really understand the value of being out there. But if it's business to business services, do you ever say to your clients, it's just not worth it, just go out there and sell direct? Don't worry about it. Apart from search engine optimization, most of our sales come when we go direct to customers. You know, we call them, they don't call us. So why worry about the journalists? I mean, in that case, it's, you know, the marketing side of it is more about your reputation and what they come back to. Are they going to be looking at some great stuff and references? But, you know, it's it's about the hustle. It's getting out there and having those relationships which are stronger. And I don't have a huge B2B experience necessarily, like other than my own contracts and things like that. But, um, yeah, I mean, I think there's also really unique ideas there around how do you reach... You know, if you look at something like in enterprise, you've got Salesforce who are always trying to get, you know, different clients. And it's like, oh, you can have this and you can have this. And you always get those callbacks. And sometimes when you're looking for a provider of a certain service, you go to two or three providers. So you're always offering the same thing. And thinking about marketing in a different way or, you know, that's kind of unique where they're not getting the standard box email back. Thank you. It was great to have a conversation with you let's set up a call next week you know maybe if you have the resources or you know you're, you're in the neighborhood you could stop by or you know there's there's I think people um this kind of coming back to like the social media of like there's like those checks and balances and trying to keep it really easy but I really for me the reason Twitter and social media is important is because it's social it's because it gives you more of a chance to see the person behind you know who you're talking to and if I was actually working, this is a little bit off from what you were saying, but I've been working a lot with nonprofits, so big global um, nonprofits. And what I start to look at is they're like, oh, we need a social media person more in like the last 18 months. And I said, before you do that, you have to fix your website because it's shit. It's awful. You know, <laughs> it's horrible. And nonprofit websites are the worst. And I think nonprofits, you know, they forget that they're a business and they are a business. So what I would say is like, you need to kind of, look at what that is, but also try and shift how you're, how you're working with people and how you're having that relationship with them. Um, and, uh, yeah, anyways, I lost my thought, but. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, uh, can you shout or? Yeah, no, I can shout. Um, I'm, I'm really interested in what you're talking about, about social enterprise. And I was wondering, if, you know, this idea of social enterprises being businesses as well, and I think you're absolutely right, they often completely forget about it. And I'm wondering whether you've come across any tools that, that, that people use to, to evaluate the, the social impact of what they do. Um, I mean, you know, are you aware of what they, of any tools that they use to, things like social return on investment, the balance scorecard, or anything like that, that you found helpful? Yeah, I don't know anything specifically that I would ref refer to, and that's I think there's a lot of in that space that's really interesting to help people. I mean, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of companies that will see where you can start to calculate your carbon emissions and calculate, and there's lots of things that do that, which you know they can adopt. Maybe there's an API they could use to adopt within their own company to show their customers whether you're taking a flight or doing something um, that you're able to share, but I, th I think it's really lacking. There's, for me, especially with activists or people that kind of want to start something or along the lines of a, a social enterprise, there, there are a lot of people doing that, but there's a lot of people that get the same focus, you know, like a Scott Harrison of Charity Water and like, you know, Blake from all these kind of people that are put up. There's sort of 10 to 20 of them internationally and they do the circuit and they talk and we all get the same stuff. But what we're lacking is a lot of the connections where we can actually share. Um, a bit more of how to how to sort of innovate around that because you you start to have a, a handful of models and that works but um, and also I've always worked internationally so I'm really fascinated how things are working internationally and um, but yeah I don't have any I wish I did if you do share with me please yeah. <laughs> um, but it's an interesting space I mean we're seeing it grow more and more you see a lot of universities and this ends up being the sense of social entrepreneurship courses, and you can take a degree in social entrepreneurship now, um, which is fascinating. I'd love to sit in and see what they talk about. So it's a lot of buzzwords, and I, I don't like to get caught up in that. You know, I think most people understand what an entrepreneur is, and I think everyone should sort of be good at heart. So, um, But social entrepreneurship to me, I mean, there's different models in the U.S. Of, around social entrepreneurship of how you're 
um, to me is like you want to put most of your profits back into the community or ways of doing that. You know, there's only so much money you need, really. So if, if you have that kind of business and can help, um, that's a little bit the difference. Yeah. And in terms of tools, you know, uh, do you know do I know any tools like that? I know. I mean, I I know that people use a lot of slightly bigger businesses, not startups, use social return on investment, which is quite an interesting way of looking at it. It's, uh, you know, it's the same kind of thing as, but it's as return on investment, as financial return on investment. But it's just a, you just need to put a lot more thinking into it, and it puts people off. Yeah, and even like the space I'm working in, which is, you know, volunteerism, which isn't actually seen too much as a business, but it actually has, a, you know, at least in the U.S., it has a dollar value of twenty one seventy eight an hour. Um, so you can value if you have interns or people that are, you know, giving their time, you can actually quote that. Um, I have a friend of mine who's uh, working on a startup right now. He just had an idea where he was asked you know, that sort of pick, can I pick your brain scenario um, where you get too many people asking, can I have a coffee with you? Can I do this? Um, the idea around valuing, um, like he doesn't want the money, but he would take a coffee with you for half an hour or take a phone call for 15 minutes where he could talk to other entrepreneurs, but to go through an app where you could actually charge for that. So none of the money would go to you, but it would go to a cause you care about and you give some time. And I've been sort of bantering with him about the idea because they're just about to launch. And I was like, that's great. You know, it's just a little, you know, it's not a huge business, but it has the potential to actually be quite powerful because it's something people do every day. And if you can give up your time and you know that it's going to go to a great cause, why not, why not try it? So, you know, you just have to experiment and try those things. And yeah, I think on many professional services platforms where... Um, where people's work is being valued on a per, per hour basis and there are projects. I think charities could also do projects and say like all those people could still work for their hourly rate, but you know, on that particular project that money would go to a charity. So I think it's also a social good PR marketing opportunity mar opportunity for all different platforms like Elance or you know like many freelancer platforms. Yeah, I advise a social enterprise in the UK called Bright One, and uh, it works with PR students who want to break into the industry. But the idea is that um, we're matching the, them with nonprofits that tend not to pay for communication support, but then also we're matching that with. Um, uh, with PR professionals who've been in the industry and have experience. So the quality is going to be good because they're checking it. It's very project-based, so it's not going to take up someone's whole year. They can commit to it. Um, but it's, a, it's an interesting model, which is starting to tackle and venture into that pro bono um, that pro bono world of giving up your time, but maybe you can get some credit and recognition for it. So, Guys, any more questions? Mm -hmm. Okay, so thank you, uh, Amanda, for the interview. <laughs>